Perhaps we could open God's word together. Allusions have been made both in our prayers and in our singing to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is what I'd like to look at for a few minutes here toward the end of the evening. Toward the end of the meeting, rather. We will read Luke's account in chapter 22 and refer back to Matthew and Mark as well. Luke chapter 22, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, (coughs) excuse me, lest you enter into temptation. So that's Luke's account, and what I'd like to do is reread it again with some embellishments and some additions from the other Gospels. He came out from, of course, the Passover, and he came to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives has a garden in it. That garden is called Gethsemane, and Gethsemane, of course, is what's called the Olive Press. That's what the word actually means in Aramaic. And it was a place where ancient olive trees bore their fruit and where those fruits were pressed to produce the beautiful olive oil. And I've never been there myself, but they say there are still ancient olive trees in that grove on that very place. Christ had had the Passover in the upper room in Jerusalem, possibly at the house owned by Mark's mother Mary. And so this was quite a trek across the city. And as Judas already had orchestrated his betrayal and arrest, he had to, unless he had insider information, it's most likely that he went to the Garden of Gethsemane after first coming to the place where they were having the Passover. Because you remember there was a man who followed them, a man who ultimately would run naked from them because his cloak was grabbed. His name was John Mark. And it's likely that when they first arrived, at the place where the upper room where the Passover had taken place with Christ and his disciples and found that he was gone, the next idea Judas would have is he's gone to the Mount of Olives. He's gone to Gethsemane because he often resorted there with his disciples. That's where he would go at a time like this. And Mark follows them. When they arrive at the Garden of Gethsemane, he has his disciples wait and he tells them, you need to pray. Mark says, you need to watch. And if we conflate these two, because we have both expressions in Matthew, I think it is watch and pray. That's a very good word for us today. Temptations are things that come our way every day. First of all, you need to be awake and alert. Second, you need to depend on the Lord. You need to pray. Don't try to do it in your own strength. If Christ went to the Father in prayer in in order (coughs) that he might face the trial that was ahead of him, Surely we need to do the same thing. It's just a real great example. We have the example of how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's one prayer the Lord gave as a model prayer. I suggest in a very different situation now, a situation of for us would be terror and panic. This is another model of how we can pray. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed. When he came to the place, he says, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and and prayed. This is an interesting expression, because here we don't have the information that we do in Matthew and Mark, that he took three disciples a little bit farther, and Peter, James, and John. And then he himself went a little farther. In those images, I think what we see is the Lord Jesus entering from the outside environment into the courtyard and then taking P- 
Peter and James and John into the holy place and then he himself going the next step where he, he alone could go into the holiest. So we see sort of a tabernacle arrangement here. Most of the group here in the courtyard, three of them closer, more attentive and better witnesses of what was about to happen, but ultimately only one who could go into the holy place to grapple about what was going to happen here with his father. It seems <coughs> that Luke wants to create a different image. He says the distance between Christ and where the disciples were left was a stone's throw, <coughs> which with my arm would only be about 25 feet, I think, but farther ahead. Now, why does he say a stone's throw? Well, of course, in the old days, that was just one way of measuring a short distance. It reminds us, though, about the fact that the rebellious son in Deuteronomy 21 was to be stoned. And that's an ironic allusion because here the most obedient of all sons who would never displease his father and should never have been punished in any way, much less by being stoned, is now being put in a place where someone who would be stoned would be set in order to be punished. I think that's a very touching allusion. The perfect, obedient son stood in our place. One of the things we're going to discover that Christ is anticipating here is substitution. He's anticipating God's wrath. The deep distress and the sorrow I don't really think are over what Judas and the band would do to him, nor even perhaps the crucifixion itself. But he's anticipating what our brother referred to in his prayer, the cup. And in this context, that cup is divine wrath. There's a sense in which we may have to drink a cup. He told James and John that you shall drink the cup that I shall drink of, meaning that they would go to a martyr's death. That cup was different from this cup. This cup is his alone, and only he could drink it. This is the cup of the wrath of God, poured out without mixture, as we read in Revelation. A very consistent symbol, rather, from Old Testament to New, of divine wrath. That is what has got his soul distressed and in great grief at this time. So he knelt down and prayed. It's very much like Luke to emphasize prayer, and there's more about prayer of the disciples and praying to the disciples and reminding us of Luke's emphasis on prayer. But, of course, the other, other accounts also tell us about prayer. And Mark, which is often the most emotional and the most uh, dramatic of the Gospels, actually tells us that he kept falling down. So the scene seems to be that he went and he would prostrate himself on the ground. He would pray. He would stand up and he would do it again. And we're given three times when he prayed, came back, prayed, came back, prayed. But it appears that even in, in each of those cases, there was more than one utterance of the prayer. So Mark says he kept falling down and he kept praying, Father, please take this cup away from me if it is your will. Now, he was with, <coughs> he said, we're actually at that point in Luke's narrative where we're reading, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Here's one of the more interesting, difficult uh, expressions. And again, we need to bring all of the things we were thinking about yesterday to bear on our understanding of what is being said here. First of all, one interpretation, which is incorrect and cannot be correct because it would contradict the rest of Scripture, is that, I'm only here because you're making me be here. This is the last thing I want to do. Uh, it's not my will to go. But since I have agreed to be your servant and you want me to go, I guess I'll go. That kind of, uh, that's a sort of a fatalistic re resignation is not what's being discussed here at all. There is only one divine will. And that divine will uniformly was that this offering needed to be made. And one of the reasons that we have this account and we have the witnesses, Peter, James and John, uh, who were, were able to <clears throat> then tell the others through the scriptures what had happened here, is the same reason, I suppose, that we have witnesses at the cross that heard him say, it is finished, or, ha or heard him cry that great cry, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Those are questions, the answer to which Christ knew, but he wanted us to ponder them. They were questions raised in the Old Testament, in Psalm 22, in that case, and they were answered at the cross. So what he's saying here is that I, 
the servant of the Lord have come to the place where I need to be. He said, <laughs> he said uh, no man takes my life from me. We reminded ourselves of that yesterday. This is his will to be here. He wants to be here. But what he's saying is, what matters here, the only significant factor in this decision is my father's will. It isn't my will, and it isn't my human will pitted against my divine will. It is that the will that is in question, the will that matters, the only significant issue here is, does my father wish me to do this? Because if he does not, it would be wonderful if this cup could pass away. You say, well, if he knew the will, why would he ask the question? For the same reason I just said, he asks questions that we might answer them. The father answers the question by silence, presumably, because this is, of course, something already agreed on before the world began. He is showing his subservience as the servant of the Lord. What he is not suggesting or showing is any disagreement with the divine will. He's saying, your will is, if it's to go, I would, it's my will too. I want to do it. This is a spiritual exercise. He says, spiritually later, the spirit is willing although the flesh is weak. Then we move on to this interesting expression. An angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Now this is an expression that, um, well, let's just take it at face value. You may say, why, why would he need an angel strength? This is a Luke, Luke and touch. Obviously only Luke mentions this, all right? So, he was also strengthened by angels in his temptation, according to Mark, in the wilderness. There is, although the humanity of Christ is perfectly normal humanity, and he was a perfect specimen of humanity, um, I don't think he was anything, I don't, I don't want to create any idea that he was a superman. In his humanity, he was just as human as you and I. But you understand that we have the detritus in us of much genetic um, shall we say, mistakeage through the years and disease and bad habits and other things that we've acquired through the years have made us maybe just less than the ideal Adonis, uh, you know, uh, like the ancient uh, sculptures were of idealized human beings. And I suggested while Christ is perfectly normal, being sinless, being free of illness, he was a, a wonderful looking specimen of a man. Uh, that's, a, that's my speculation and I would counter that by saying scripture doesn't describe what he looked like. That, that isn't the important thing. But nevertheless, he was human. And if he got into a situation of distress when he was fasting, his physical body would become weak just like yours would. It would never die. He would be able to completely control that switch. But it would become weak. And it was weak. And God acknowledges that. And the mercy of God here is not that I'm going to take that cup away, but that I'm going to help you endure it. I'm going to take you through it. Then he begins to pray more earnestly. Now, this is a very strange expression. How can the Son of God pray more earnestly? Was he not being serious the first time? No, that's not what's being said. What's being said is that the emotional content here has been coming to a crescendo. And as the hour gets closer and closer, his emotional distress is greater and greater. Luke doesn't emphasize some of the things that Matthew and Mark do about the, I am, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even to the point of death. He began to be sore amazed and very heavy, as the King James says. And those words do convey much to us of, of the kind of distress and grief and psychological um, and dissonance or whatever fancy word you want to use. That, that are just the peak of what a human could experience facing such an awful thing. And Luke tells us, instead of emphasizing that, that his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now I'm going to stick my neck out here and tell you what I think. I don't think he was bleeding. You say, well, it says great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Yeah, but you've got to read the word before it, Jose, the Greek word, like as. It's as great drops of blood. It doesn't think it is great drops of blood. We say, well, I hear stories of people in great distress who bleed in their sweat. Uh, Hematidrosis, they call that. Well, if you look into that, you find that that's a very occult thing. It's associated with uh, 
pagan religions such as Hinduism and their frenzied demonic rites. And it is not really physiologically plausible that a normal person, even in great distress, is going to bleed sweat or sweat blood. You say, well, you're, uh, we don't agree with you because we've always taught that he drops of blood fell down to the ground. No, sweat. That tells us two things. Number one, medically he had diaphoresis. Diaphoresis is the most dangerous symptom or finding you can see when you see someone walk through the emergency room door. You're not going to be faking it. That person is having an MI. That person has dangerously low, low blood sugar. That person has a pulmonary embolism. That person has something gravely wrong with them. If they come in pouring sweat. Now, the Lord didn't have those physical problems, but he's taking the physiology of humanity to the very limit. And Luke is doing something literarily we call foreshadowing. Just as this anguish now is leading to dripping, dripping, dripping. And in the dark, it wouldn't be clear what the dro drops were. Yet on the cross, that dropping would become drops of blood. Even before it, when he was tormented in Pilate's judgment hall. Regardless of what you conclude on that verse, we're looking at a physical expression of anguish beyond anything any of us have experienced. When he arose from prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, another emphasis on prayer, lest you enter into temptation. Just a couple of thoughts as I conclude here. I mentioned, first of all, that the cup that he wants, that he's anticipating here, is not just going to a martyr's death. I didn't really develop this yesterday, but I want to say a couple things about penal substitution. There are many false theories of the atonement. There are theories of the atonement, for example, that say Christ was acting as the ideal man, taking his devotion to God all the way to martyr's death, and therefore should we not follow in his steps and be willing to lay down our lives as well. Well, that is very true. It's not that these false theories of the atonement are wrong. They're just inadequate, okay? There is one that has been popular for the past 50 years called Christus Victor, which is Christ the victor. And what it says is that, well, he appeared to be defeated. In fact, he was able to destroy the power of Satan in the cross and was victorious and earned himself a kingdom that God is now going to award him because of his devotion. There certainly is an element of truth in that. What is missing is penal substitution. There are some that we say he died for us in the sense that he can now empathize to the nth degree with anything we're asked to call, call to go through up to including death. But he didn't die in our place. And then there are some who say he died in our place, perhaps as a man, but he did not bear our sins in dying in our place. And all of these are either inadequate or they're incorrect. We go back to Genesis chapter 22. There are two pictures. First of all, the devotion of Isaac and the devotion to Abraham and the devotion of Abraham to God. And that's a wonderful picture. But you know, there's a switch in the scene. There's a very dramatic switch that's thrown halfway through. And that's when the angel of the Lord calls out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Now Isaac becomes a different metaphor altogether. Now Isaac is no longer viewed as the obedient son. Isaac is now viewed, and this is the complexity of the picture and the wonderful way in the scripture can teach more than one thing out of one story. Isaac now becomes the sinner and the ram dies in his place. And in this setting, we have the first clear, explicit explanation of substitution in the Bible. The ram was offered in the stead of his son, Isaac. He's dying in his place. Isaiah 53, which we've enjoyed thoughts of this morning, clearly teaches substitution. That he made intercession for the transgressors. The Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. When we come into the New Testament, we have many, many places we could teach this, and I'm only going to mention one for time. <coughs> it's the expression, there is one God, from 1 Timothy 2, one, one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself an antilutron. 
You say, I thought it said a ransom. Well, it does in English, but I'm going to explain that this verse is, this word cho choice is very important. The word lutron is simply a ransom. But by putting the preposition anti in front of it, you mean that the, that the price was paid by one person in the stead of another. Anti in the Bible, a relatively, not extremely common, but a relatively common preposition, always means instead of, in the place of. It does not mean against. So when you get the word antichrist, antichrist, many people say this is a person who is against Christ, just like, you know, anti-disestablishmentarianism is against disestablishmentarianism or something. That's supposed to be an English word, by the way, one of your longer ones. Anti, we usually think of as against. In the Bible, it's not. You can take each case and prove anti always means instead of. So those who are instead of may well be against. The antichrist is the replacement Christ. He's instead of Christ. He wants to be the Christ. And in that sense, he's very much against God's Christ. So there are many expressions, I just met, went, read one of them, that sh must be defined because of anti as substitution. And then we have additional information, of course, a brother quoted this morning, who his own self bear our sins in his own body upon the tree. So any view of the sufferings of Christ cannot fall short of the fact that he stood in the sinner's place and that he bore the sinner's guilt. That's the cup. That's what's being discussed here. That's what's making his soul so distressed and causing him to be diaphoretic. One more point, if you allow me to go to like five after. This is a practical one. I mentioned something briefly yesterday and a couple of people commented on it. Um, I mentioned that in the three parts of the human being, the body is world conscious, space and time conscious, sense conscious, the soul is self-aware, but the spirit is God-aware. Now, the soul can, can be contributing to intellectual functioning, contributing even to decision-making. But on the whole, you would think, if you want to simplistically think of what a soul does, think of what an animal does, because animals have souls. They have the animating principle within them. Uh, we don't often preach in the gospel, they don't have souls, but in fact, they do have souls. Just read Genesis 1 from there on. They have that life principle within their body. That life principle is not capable of reverence. It's not capable of rationality. It's not capable of restraining themselves from doing what their instincts tell them to do. So in a great sense, animals, the soulish animal is a program creature. He will do what he wishes to do based on instincts and environmental cues, and there's not a lot of diversity there. The human is an entirely different creature. God breathed into his mouth the breath of life, that soul, that spirit. And man became a living soul. He already had a body formed, right? So the spirit came in and the soul was created and now we have three parts. The three parts are in Gethsemane. The flesh is weak. The disciples' flesh was weak. They were sorrowful. They had weakness, perhaps it was due to their sin and inadequacy and lack of faith. But even the body of Christ had weakness that he allowed to come into it because of his distress and because of his devotion. And an angel took care of that matter. What does he say, though, about his anguish? We didn't read it in Luke. My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. The soul is basically the seat of emotion. If Christ had done what most of us do and had decided to run things based on feelings, and on emotions. He might, he couldn't because he's impeccable, but th and, 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 you know, ostensibly or theoretically we could say he might have opposed doing what God wanted him to do because his feelings weren't there. Did Christ feel like going to the cross? No. He didn't feel like going to the cross any more than you would. Did he desire to go to the cross? We've moved now from soul to spirit. Was his will to go to the cross? Absolutely. And this is where Christians need to get a sense of their three component parts. If you let your body run the show, that gets you in trouble in a variety of ways we won't explain now. They're obvious. More often, though, we make our decisions based on soulish concerns. Does it look good, image-driven? Is it, it could, even the soul temptation, remember, of Christ 
was to see the panorama of all the kingdoms of the world, a vision, sort of like a television, right? Or a big screen. It's the problem of images today. It was a very image-driven culture. Images play to the emotions. And they're very attractive. And so many people say, I do what I do because I feel like doing it. The problem with that is you're letting the, the soul be run, uh, soul run rather, everything and not the spirit. The spirit is being suppressed. The correct thing to do is what Christ did. The spirit is willing. The soul is in grief. The body is weak. And when he says the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak, he's talking to his disciples. But the principles, again, since the angel came to strengthen him, also applied in a holy way to his own person, body, soul, and spirit. So my take-home message, as well as hopefully enjoying the devotion of the Lord and understanding his grief, which I have not explained well, but the scriptures speak for themselves. Number one, the value of prayer. A model prayer in a very different setting from what we get on the Sermon on the Mount. A model of prayer of a man in distress who's still totally dependent on God. And his will aligns with God. And the purpose that you should have in praying is not that you should change God's mind. Your purpose in prayer is to align your will with his and to say, not my will, but thine be done. That doesn't mean you can't ask for things, but you ask for them according to his will. And if his will is no, then your own will should become no rather than continuing to pester him. You say, well, the importunate widow kept pestering him. Well, there's a place for that, but I don't think uh, what the Lord is doing here is pestering. He's not refusing the first answer, refusing the second answer, and taking the third answer. He's showing that areas of great concern can be continued to be brought before the Lord legitimately. But ultimately, his will will align with God's. The second point and final one is that you and I ought to run our lives spiritually. We do what is right, what is scriptural. We do what in conversation with God that controls our souls, our souls control our bodies, and we have the correct order, spirit, soul, and body. If you do what you feel like doing, here's the problem. Number one, you're going to have a guilty conscience, assuming it was something you shouldn't have done. Number two, you're not going to feel good about it afterwards either, so you even lose the feeling. So you have neither a good spirit or a good soul about it. You got some temporary fix, and now everything's bad. Now let me reverse the tables. You feel like doing something that is either unprofitable or wrong. Your spirit says, no, I'm not going to do it. And then the temptation passes and the spirit remains clear and in fellowship with God. And the feelings are fine. They're just fine. There was only a temporary problem that needed to be stepped over. But because we're so quick to respond to our feelings and so slow to depend on God's word, so quick to take images and feelings, so slow to take truth and scripture, we get into trouble, sort of like the disciples did here. But our blessed Lord triumphed in the garden, just as he would soon triumph at the cross. And I'm sorry for going over 10 minutes. May the Lord bless his word.